So hello and welcome to today's Winchester Heritage Open Days virtual event. I am Julie and today I'm speaking with Damien Dibbon, the author of The History Keepers and Tomorrow. Welcome, Damien. Thank you. Lovely to be here. Oh, it's good to have you. So can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and how you came to write books? Yeah. So, um, I mean, it was uh, the, the journey when I look back on it now seems a sort of uh, an obvious one. But at the time, I didn't know that was the journey I was going to take. Uh, essentially, both my father and my stepfather were artists and I was very sort of a very kind of visual person myself. Art was my favourite subject. And uh, uh, initially, when I left school, um, I went to art school and I studied uh, theatre design. Um, and uh, it kind of set me up in this sort of whole visual world. And when I left there, uh, I worked in film studios like a Pinewood where they made the James Bond films and so on, um, and uh, did a certain amount of theatre work. One thing or another led me uh, into being an actor, which I was for about four years uh, in movies and, you know, television stage. Uh, and then that... Um, got me interested in writing scripts and I'd never considered myself much of a uh, a writer I absolutely love stories uh, but you know I wasn't necessarily particularly good at English or anything at school but in a way writing a script doesn't sort of commit you to sort of being a, a brilliant writer because essentially you're writing a series of instructions which are then going to be interpreted by the people making the film um, and I, you know, I absolutely love the world, you know, film possibly had been my sort of first love. I was just obsessed from, from you know, when I was very, very young. Uh, and, you know, I was lucky enough, I went to Hollywood. Uh, I was back and forth for about five years and I worked for DreamWorks and Warner Brothers uh, and, uh, you know, uh, writing, you know, a whole load of scripts or joining teams of writers on scripts because often, there's more than one writer on the script. And then it was it was around probably about 12 years ago when I was still doing this. And, I, you know, I was always being sent books, uh, not necessarily to being given the job, but being considered for a job to adapt them uh, for the screen. And that's when I started thinking, maybe I should, you know, have a go at writing a book, because in a way it sort of brings together everything that I had learned. So, you know, the whole, the, the visual thing, the, the love of stories, the, the acting part of it, uh, and then obviously the sort of writing of scripts and the making of stories. Um, and uh, the, the sort of the moment, you know, the eureka moment as it were, was I was actually reading a book at the time. Uh, it was like a children's encyclopedia uh, about, it was, I think it was literally called the history of the world. and it just sort of went, charted all the civilizations, you know, right back, you know, to the sort of earliest civilizations through ancient Egypt and Greece and, and so on and so forth and China uh, and sort of led up to where we are now. And I just suddenly had this idea that I wanted to almost tell a sort of, have an adventure story that weaved its way through some of these incredible moments in history. Um, uh, and I think what struck me was how everything was connected and how one thing always led to another, uh, whether it was kind of going forward or going back, uh, and how particularly certain individuals uh, changed the course of history by what they did, you know, inventors or, or explorers uh, or kings or even, you know, the despots, uh, and uh, how I just, I, I just wanted to tell, you know, as have a window into areas of this you know wonderful story that we've all that's all resulted in us uh, and so that's when I came up with the idea for the history keepers which was my first books um, and I'll just say quickly uh, at the time I have been working uh, in the in the film world they uh, you know they call them sort of family films um, you know, sort of, sort of anything from sort of animation to sort of something like ET, where you know a whole family can go and see it. And I had very much been in that world, and so it was normal. You know, it just seemed obvious for me to start writing for the same kind of world. You know, to appeal to everyone, but particularly your sort of 
focusing your attention on on children uh so that's 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 how i came to start writing books and now i just love doing it and don't want to do anything else it's amazing i and i do love that you link history with with like your love for the visual uh, and that is absolutely amazing so because your books is about bringing historical events to life um mm. so and your book series history keepers is an adventure series about a boy joining a time traveling secret service kind of um can you tell us a bit more about these books and where your inspiration came from you've kind yeah. of mentioned a bit about it it's mm. from your background but tell us so, a bit more about yeah, so, uh, how i often pitch stories is the boy finds out his parents are lost in history uh, and he sort of has to track them down so sort of to give it this kind of emotional angle as it were that you know the boy is looking for his family uh, he doesn't know that his parents have actually been secret service agents uh, for the for the history keepers you know throughout their life uh, and they've occasionally gone off on missions and he, he thought they were just you know going to sort of business uh, <laughs> events in Birmingham and such forth but actually they've been sort of traveling to Renaissance you know Venice and, and, and such places uh, and so he's sort of thrown headfirst into this world he's uh, he's discovers that he's in imminent danger I mean it all starts in London during this storm and the first book is actually called The Storm Begins uh, and he is uh, essentially kidnapped by a, a member of this secret service uh, and sort of told the truth of of who he is and that he may have the potential uh, to move around in time um, and I, you know I should say because I, I never really like time traveling stories where they just sort of go into a box and press a button it's a it's a sort of very physical sort of visceral way that they travel in time which essentially involves them getting onto a boat and going into the ocean uh to a point called the horizon point where you essentially see nothing but sea all around you uh and then you take this uh this special uh, substance called atomium uh and it reacts with the sort of various parts of your atoms there are you know decent scientific explanations for it uh which which uh somehow connect you to these parts of history and you're able to continue your journey on the boat as it were and then travel to these places so in the first book they are actually tra they travel to renaissance venice you know to venice at the beginning of the uh, 16th century and it and it feels like a journey to actually get there um and in the first story and uh, i suppose there's a sort of james bond style like element to it you know there's always someone who is trying to uh destroy the world and of course in in this instance it's it's they're not only just trying to destroy the world they're trying to destroy the whole of history they're trying to change the course of history you know for their own ends uh and in the first book uh there's a prince uh, some german prince who essentially uh wants to <coughs> destroy the renaissance before it can get going and change the course of history and sort of enslave people um uh the second book which is set in ancient rome uh is all about um uh, destabilizing rome uh, essentially starting armies that will sort of war against each other and sort of destroy uh, that whole republic uh, and the third book uh, is, is is partly in in Shakespeare in London, partly in uh, Ming Dynasty China, uh, and that's all about uh, trying to uh, the, the villain in that is trying to destroy world trade, you know, because obviously it was a time when the whole world was suddenly trading with each other, and East and West were, were you know, it was it was becoming sort of global even then in the 1600s. Um, so so there's each of those stories takes place but there's also this story about his family uh i mentioned at the beginning that uh jake who's who's our hero uh you know lost his parents uh, but it also turns out his brother uh, may also be somewhere in history uh and um uh, he always thought his brother had died when he was a teenager uh, so 
that becomes a major part of the story. So there's 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 a sort of big story, and then there's the more intimate family story of, of this family trying to reunite again. Oh, that's uh, amazing. Sorry, and you were um, just the second part of your question, and you know, stop me if I'm talking. <laughs> Um, was about inspirations mm. uh, and uh, um, I would say uh, you know in a way my the the chief I feel all this came from so when I myself was a child uh, and I was lucky enough um, you know I was um, we lived you know from when I was about five till I was about 15 uh, just in Gloucester Road essentially near all the galleries and museums of London, so just by the Natural History Museum, the Science Museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum. And um, me and my brother just spent, you know, all our time in them. And it, it, uh, it all, everything came to life. You know, that's when I became obsessed with everything. And I, I loved it all, you know, from the, there was the Geological Museum, which is all about volcanoes and, and earthquakes, you know, and then sort of walking around the V&A, to the kind of the rooms of all the costumes of people from history all of it excited me and all of it made me interested in those periods uh, and in in the pioneers of, of those far-off times and what they managed to do and how they changed the world for the better and as I said as I mentioned before also the kind of the villains of history and and how sometimes taking a step back ended up with another step forward uh, in a different direction. Uh, and I just, it just opened my eyes to the, the possibilities of everything. And I, I think that was the, you know, the most inspiring thing in it, in it, you know, to this day, I still, you know, go probably weekly to one of those museums and walk around and, you know, get, get ideas. So I, I was never someone who thought, museums were, were dry or dull places you know it, it was you know you just add a bit of imagination and just everything comes to life. Well that's absolutely amazing and museums they contain so much history and it's just trying to maybe look beyond what's there and then try to imagine you being back in time which you are kind of doing with these books and there's three so far Hmm. Will there be a fourth? Um, yes, yeah, so the plan had always been uh, for, for there to be at least four books, I mean, maybe even more, but um, the, the sequence that I had in my head was four, and, and it's in, you know, the third book does end on this uh, really terrible cliffhanger, um, which uh, has, uh, you know, uh, has irritated a lot of people. Um, myself included, um, but um, the the last book was you know the, it was all set up to essentially return sort of go to the the deepest part of history back to uh, ancient Egypt, um, and uh, you know I'm still determined that that will be written. Um, sadly, my um, the, the 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 team that I work with at Random House on the on the first books uh, they they kind of all left the company uh, so there was a different team of publishers but and then I started you know on these books for adults uh, but you know the intention is to go back to it and at least finish that fourth instalment which is all in my head um, but yeah I do I do get a lot of uh, mail about it you know continually which is the, it's very gratifying to receive um but i feel very guilty that that i've left people on this cliff edge <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i can get that it's uh when it's on a cliffhanger you're just oh my god i need to know i need to know um but yeah so hopefully in the future we will yeah. know um but no, also, i should say yeah i was just gonna say just just one more uh, thought on this sort of inspirational uh, side of things was a, about, uh, and maybe you were about to ask this, but about the places uh, it, that I write about, um, and um, it, you know, again, it's so it's so curious how experience you have when you're you're young kind of have such an impact on you. And I I, I didn't I went abroad for the very first time when I was eleven. 
and I'd never been on a plane or gone anywhere. And we went to Venice with this, it was like a school trip. I mean, it seems incredible now. Um, but I, it, it had such a huge impact on me. I mean, essentially because Venice is a place that is, you really do travel back in time by just literally visiting it. Um, and uh, it, it more or less features in just about everything I've ever written since. Uh, you know, I'm just completely charmed by it. Um, but also, I think growing up in London and living in central London, just that the mixture of the the sort of the ancient next to this sort of super modern, I find so exciting. You know, I love all the new buildings going up as much as I love all the sort of incredible architecture of the, of the old buildings in it. Um, you know, so that London is the other place I, I kind of return to again over and over. But anyway, I, I digress. You were going to ask something else. <laughs> no, that's actually one of my questions is because you do in your books, they travel across Europe, uh, not just places, but times. And I just wondered if these places are inspired by your travels because as you said you've been traveling a lot uh, even not just Europe but mm. also in Hollywood and you've got some inspirations there yeah. so how do you decide which places to include in your stories and what time periods to write about I mean they it's I suppose places have a sort of uh, some places have just this kind of romance I mean they have a romance in your head and then when you visit them they have you know an even more of a romance um, uh, I mean Rome is such an obvious uh, place to choose you know because it, it's it's such a incredibly exciting and vibrant city you know that's very much alive as it is but also there is so much preserved there from, you know, from ancient times. Uh, and you, you know, the fact that uh, the Curia, which is kind of essentially the Senate house that, that Julius Caesar built is still standing and it's still got its roof on. And you can go in and sit where the senators sat. Just, just I find mind blowing. Um, and the Pantheon is another, you know, this is the biggest concrete roof, I, I think still in existence anywhere in the world. And that is standing. Uh, added to which you've got, you know, the whole of the Roman Forum, which is sort of in the centre of the city leading up to the Colosseum. Uh, and yeah, a lot of it is kind of in pieces, but, you know, you go there with your books of what exactly it looked like before and you, you know, very soon you can uh, imagine it and, and it comes to life. Um, so that that was a particularly exciting place. I mean, I went to China as well when I was working on the third History Keepers book. Um, and China is quite notable because there is so much history has been lost, particularly over the last century. Um, but you can go into the Forbidden City in Beijing, uh, which I think came very close to being uh, actually knocked down uh, during the Cultural Revolution in the 60s. And, and thank God it, it, it wasn't. Uh, famously, um, uh, Chairman Mao uh, never actually went into it. He was too spooked uh, by it. I mean, I may have that wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm almost certain that that is correct. Uh, and it just sort of loomed as this sort of like his kind of conscience somewhere in the middle of the city. Uh, but to walk into that, you know, and a lot of it is five, six hundred, seven hundred years old. Uh, and you get this just sense of this unbelievably sort of formal grand sort of majestic uh you know empire uh and you you're just taken right back in time uh but you you, you can go to a, a city that has you know very little left of it and you can still uh create things around it and for me what's important is i never want to bore people with um you know historical details rather the opposite you want to really make them feel that they know what it would be like you know to arrive in venice in the 1400s in the middle of the night and and the lights and the lanterns on the boat and how dark it was or to to go into the Colosseum, you know at the height of the roman empire and just the noise of the place and the kind of smell of 
sweat and the people and and you know just the excitement uh, around that and to really uh, you know because these are things that actually happened you know it's not like a fantasy story uh, you know history happened and it's this all of it is this incredible story so you're you're you know I wanted to take people to those places and make them feel exactly what it would have been like, um, you know, because they would have been witnessed by, you know, normal people like we all are. Um, so yeah, it's uh, geography is a, uh, you know, is a is a big thing, um, and I in the new book, which I'm probably going to ask about, uh, you know, that. <laughs> that uh well actually i'll leave the questions to you and then i'll come back to <laughs> geography in that. i do like how you're kind of transporting people through history to kind of get them more involved kind of instead of just well i say just uh reading facts um because it's a lot of imagination and i guess that comes a bit from your uh background in film and and stuff like that so have you thought about the history keepers and your background in screenwriting and theatre and films maybe turning them into movies or a tv series even mm. or yes yeah, so absolutely um you know it's it's uh, you know as i said film was my first love and in a way i'm uh, the, i treat <laughs> almost writing books as if i'm writing a film i want to see but writing it in book form um but um Actually, the History Keepers, uh, before it came out, which is, I mean, nearly 10 years ago now, um, was optioned by Working Title, uh, which is a British company, um, you know, who, who did, you know, all, all the uh, <coughs> Richard Curtis films and Elizabeth and, I mean, endless British films. Uh, they're part of Universal Studios. Uh, and, um, they yeah so their plan was to sort of turn it into a uh to a franchise um sadly things just take forever in film um as people will know uh you know there are books that just you know will take decades to actually come onto the screen i mean i'm i'm particularly excited at the moment um uh by uh Dune, uh, which is obviously the famous sci-fi book. I know there was a film in the 80s, uh, but you know, this is a book of sort of decades and decades old. Uh, and finally, it looks like there's an inc there's a film coming out this, this uh, autumn that will do justice to it. And it, sometimes it just takes a long time and, you know, you have to be very patient about things. But that said, um, we're probably going to now explore sort of television options as well, because, you know, there's been such such an explosion uh, and I think in you know I think it's incredibly exciting it's almost like the golden age of cinema you know because obviously in cinema in the sort of 30s and 40s and 50s I mean it was just you know it ruled everything um, and gradually what you could do in the cinema became almost smaller and smaller and more and more dependent on on the budget so you could only do a certain amount you could only tell certain quite restricted stories because those are the stories that were going to essentially pay for a film to be made but um with this explosion in subscription companies netflix and so on um television has now you know now you can do anything you can tell any story and people are much more you know there there are no restrictions you you, you know you can you can be as zany or, or, or as, as commercial as you want to be and there, it's proven that there's an audience for it so it's, it's a really exciting time um, I think so yeah that hopefully this and my more recent books will all uh, find their way eventually onto the screen. Yeah I hope so because I think I love books actually better than movies sometimes because you get a bit more personal relationship with the Absolutely. characters. Absolutely, I agree. I mean, there's nothing like, re there's nothing, that feeling of reading a book and it's just you and that world and it's just a wonderful yeah. experience. You know, it's writer. amazing. But I know that a lot of people today and especially kids as well, they do love uh, watching movies or getting to know 
characters or books through movies or the screen. So hopefully in the future, the history keepers will be on the screen. Um, but you also have your book tomorrow, which is a little bit different from history keepers because the dog is the main character, basically. Uh, so can you tell us what the book is about and how did you go about writing this book? Yes. So um, uh, the book, uh, as you said, is actually narrated by a dog. Um, uh, and uh, weirdly, everyone says when they read it, you know, that is not a problem at all. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, it's really about humans, um, but, it, you know, the, the, the story is told. It's from the eyes, the viewpoint of a dog. And the dog is exceptional because he doesn't die. He's 217 years old. Um, and he uh, lost his master, who may also be uh, not immortal, but very, very long living. Uh, and he lost him 150 years ago, and he's been searching for him ever since. And this, this search takes him, uh, you know, all across Europe, from, from Venice, um, and, you know, may, most crucially through all the various courts of Europe and also through across all the battlefields of Europe. So you're, you're sort of getting this, always this juxtaposition of, of, of the kind of the majesty of, of court life and just the horror of war. Uh, and, you know, a dog, which is a, a, probably a, a fair judge of character in the first place, you know, he's, 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 his philosophy, as it were, about life is really tested and sort of enlarged uh, from these experiences he has of, of humans. And, you know, on the one hand, it's a mystery. Uh, is he going to find his master? What, what made his master disappear? Who is this sort of villainous character who seems to be always on his tail? Um, uh, so there's a sort of thriller element. Um, but mostly it's, it's, you know, it's, I suppose, a celebration of all the things I've, I've spoken about, you know, the, the, the wonders that, that human kind, <laughs> you know, have been responsible for. Um, and, you know, there's a very emotional story. He, he, he travels with this other, uh, you know, a normal dog, a stray dog. Uh, he's, he's a very funny character. Uh, and as I said, there's this apparent villain um, who is sort of on their path, who is also clearly searching for this man, uh, the lost master. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's an epic, you know, the whole thing spans about 200 years, but it has this sort of very uh, emotional core and, you know, very specifically from this viewpoint of a dog. So everything almost, the smell of everything is is sort of crucial to the 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 to to, to place uh, you know the smell of a battlefield the smell of a palace the the smell of you know Venice after a storm or whatever it happens to be um, and um, uh, you know the story is told in that way and of course history was a very smelly place you know the, yeah there was uh you know it's not like it is now um so that was a very exciting um way to to be able to tell the story I mean I didn't I didn't it was a really hard thing to pull off and it really took a long time because you know the one thing people say when they read it is like well I just it didn't worry me at all that this was you know that was like the last of their problems <laughs> well they didn't have me. but um <laughs> it was uh no, it's because there, there's some people who have sort of had a problem with the fact that he becomes a the dog essentially becomes you know after 150 years stops eating meat, and some people have sort of wrote online you know a dog would never stop eating meat, you know not so much like a dog would live for 200 years or travel the continent or philosophize about life, but he wouldn't eat meat. Um, <laughs> but actually, dogs are fine not eating meat. Um, yeah. As I, anyway, I digress um but um yeah it was it wasn't easy but when I realized because he's narrating it he can essentially just report conversation um so you hear all the human conversation it's all mm. part of the book so you don't you don't you don't feel kind of trapped in this dog world you know you're very much in a human world but just from this very specific viewpoint 
Yeah. Why a dog? Um, I mean, just I think, you know, the relationships of, of humans and dogs. I mean, it, it is ex- talking of which I think is one of that. <laughs> um it I mean it's unique in 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 the sort of the history of 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 kind of living things um you know there is there is nowhere else really you know dogs and humans have a relationship that you know tens of thousands of years old uh and um it is a very uh it's a very sort of special relationship. And I said, it, it's unique. There is no other in this sort of animal kingdom, no other thing exists. And there's something about the simplicity of a dog uh, and, and its viewpoint. Uh, and it just, you look into a dog's eyes and it, there just seems to be this sort of understanding of the world. Uh, and, you know, they're probably just thinking about food, but that's what it looks <laughs> like. Um, yeah, I get what you mean, yeah. It's a man's best friend, isn't it? Because my next question is basically, are you working on anything at the moment? So um, I've literally just finished, handed in, uh, and it's coming out next year, uh, my new book, which is called The Colour Storm, uh, that title may change. Um, And this is, uh, it's, uh, you know, just as, the book I told you about was sort of a story almost told, told in smell. This is a, a really a, a story told in colour and visual, uh, and it's all set in the art world of the Renaissance. Uh, all takes place over about two or three weeks uh, in in the early 16th century in Venice, um, and obviously that was the time when Michelangelo and Leonardo and Raphael and all these people uh, were living. Uh, and the story centres around the search. For a, of a new colour. Uh, so colours used to come into Venice, you know, most famously in the Renaissance, lapis lazuli was, you know, the, you know ultramarine was considered uh, the colour of the Renaissance. And I never actually thought about what ultramarine meant until recently, but which literally like from overseas, from over the sea, from beyond the sea or wherever. Um, so there's sort of the romance of these colours arriving uh, and all these artists, uh, came came through Venice or came to Venice to look for this colour, but this colour, uh, which is called Prince Orient, you don't know what colour it is uh, at the beginning, um, suddenly everyone is searching for. And our, our hero, um, who is actually based on a real painter called Giorgione, uh, who died, uh, you know, young when he was 31 or two, um, but, you know, many say he would have been the sort of, a sort of real titan of the Renaissance had he lived. Uh, and it's uh, he, he's our main character and he's the one who comes, you know, we're following through this story to, to, to find this colour uh, as all these other famous painters start descending on Venice also in search of it. Um, the other part of the story or the integral part of the story is that uh, there was a family called the Fugger family at the time uh, a German family, um, Jacob Fugger, uh, and he was apparently the richest man who ever lived. Uh, certainly, you know, in, would be in the top five of richest people ever lived. And he was a banker, but he had owned nearly all the mines of Europe. Uh, hence, he was the one who was the key to this colour, and he spent a lot of time uh, in a palace in Venice uh, with his young wife and. Uh, our hero um, has to sort of essentially seduce uh, this wife in order to find his way in. And it's a very, very dangerous game to play. Um, But so, yeah, it's very much about the danger of that world, the excitement of it, um, and just the, 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 the way that they were sort of, you know, they were creating, you know, they, this was a precursor to sort of films in a in way, you know, they were creating these incredible stories, telling these stories through paintings, uh, which, you know, putting emotion into paintings for the first time, putting atmosphere into paintings and, you know, colour itself, particularly oil painting, uh, you know, just was transformed everything, you know, because it was so vivid and so bright. Um, so, you know, if you wanted to tell a story, if you wanted to bring 
Christ back to life, uh, you know, for whatever reason, paint him in oils, you know, by one of these great painters and suddenly he's there with you, you know, in your in your church or in your home or wherever it might be. So it's just an it's such an exciting world. And it really, uh, you know, one thing one thing I've done just leads to another. And um, yeah, I've loved I've actually loved writing it. Uh, but again, it's a it's a mixture of, uh, you know, on the one hand, it's a thriller, it's a sort of mystery, uh, but on the other hand, it's you know, it's hopefully really fascinating about that time, that time period, and and how workshops of these famous artists, you know, operated and how they were all in competition with each other. Yeah, it, it sounds really interesting, and I assume basically it's uh, for a more adult audience. This so you're going up through the ages it's not really for kids this one uh, no this one is definitely um uh, more adults but you know uh, I, I mean over you know i mean depends what you call a kid but you know i mean yeah you know over a certain age 15 or so yeah absolutely it'd be, yeah. It'd be great to read uh, yeah but, so that's you know, coming out it, next year is it yeah, I'll be next, uh, beginning of June, I think, next year. So we're just Exciting. waiting for the artwork at the moment, which, yeah. Uh, and actually, of all the things I've written, I think it, it, it probably has the most chance of turning quicker into a, a film if it was going to happen. But just, just because, A, it's so visual, but B, because it is quite contained, you know, we're not crossing 200 years you know it's yeah. uh you know the story is essentially told in palazzi of venice and in the streets and you know it's it's a sort of very contained story even though it's dealing with things which are very ambitious but uh it's you know it's it's very doable as, as a film option and also it helps that the main characters are as kind of young and gorgeous you know <laughs> fasting purposes yeah exactly um, so if we go away a bit from the books for a bit, because you've grown up in London in and around museums. Um, so museums are very close to your heart. Why do you think they are so important and how do you think they can stay important in the future? I mean, obviously they're, they're a record of, of everything that's come before. They're, that you know I, I'm a great believer in learning from history um, you know everyone should learn from history I mean you know to have that knowledge you know available to literally everyone in the world is just uh, is, is, uh, is an incredible thing and even now just online visits to museums are, are started to become very exciting uh, I mean I think they've had to in the last year um, but um, it's, I don't know, it's, it, it's vital. It's like w wanting to find out, you know, w why we <laughs> exist at all, how life came about, where we are in the galaxy, in the universe. I mean, it's, it's just an intrinsic desire to know why, why we're here, what brought us here, why, you know, um, geographically, emotionally, physically, uh, you know, in every respect, and I and and just to, to carry on learning. I mean, sometimes I think, well, where's where's all this learning going? That's going into my head. But um, at the very least, if I can even pass a tiny bit of it on to you know to to share some of the excitement that I feel, I uh, that's I feel I'm doing something. Um, just because I'm just so in awe of what people you know what people do what people have managed to do the ambition of people uh, and it's all there in museums I and mean, it's just it's just you're forever coming across people you you would like to emulate and live up to um you know there's everyone's responsible you know and i i i love everyone you know um there's this really brilliant book that I don't know if you ever read it, the Bill Bryson book, which is called A Short History of Nearly Everything. Mm. And it's, it's, you know, it just, I mean, it literally describes everything from sort of, you know, what, you know, quantum mechanics is to, you know, 
gravity and uh, to sort of paleontology and but it just sort of talks firstly about the amazing discoveries but also about the people who've been who've made all these discoveries and the sort of length they've gone to to in order to sort of further our knowledge of, of things and I just I'm just in awe of all of those people and, and you know they just shouldn't be forgotten you know they're they're very brave usually yeah sometimes it seems like we forget the people behind the discoveries which is quite exactly. sad because yeah. we wouldn't have these discoveries if it wasn't for people yeah so. no totally yeah and it, it often is you know it, it so often does come down to individuals you know I mean it's I mean one thing's well, okay what if Einstein hadn't have been born what, would there have been someone else who, you know, you'd like to think, well, yeah, I guess someone or a few people might have discovered what he discovered. But um, it is incredible to think that so much kind of seems to pass through the mind of just one person, um, such a sort of huge kind of, this is sort of enormous sort of understanding, just opening up and some great big doors opening up. Uh, oh, yeah. something that you've never even worked out before because of one individual I just find that an amazing thing yeah one individual one incident it's the history of what if is quite scary to go down basically if you start thinking about things what if that happened yeah. a couple of minutes later what if yeah. that person didn't do this or didn't get born mm. so it's quite scary to think about it like that but it's also quite interesting Mm. So oh, fascinating and mm. you can do it with your own life I mean you yeah you know what if I hadn't have <laughs> walked into that restaurant when I did dot 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 um yeah I mean it's terrifying and and uh fascinating and in fact I always think when something kind of goes wrong I always think well actually what if something had happened before and it actually gone it'd been even worse you know, because yeah. that was a very real possibility. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So it's quite interesting, that. But yeah. <laughs> um, so because of your love for museums, uh, you are a patron for the charity Kids in Museums, mm. uh, and they focus on making museums uh, nationwide, basically, more welcoming to children, younger people and families. How do you think or feel their work gives value to children for their learning and their experience of history and heritage I mean they yeah they do an amazing job I mean as I said to you before my you know everything was kick-started for me being going as a child going to museums um, and I remember the the D Burkett who was the one who really founded the charity in the first place her she had an experience with her own very young son who was just sort of a little more than a toddler who was going around a museum sort of really excited but sort of shouting at things and he was being sort of shushed by the people and I think that just uh, made her want to do something about it because of course they should be these exciting living noisy places uh, and I think they really sort of changed the, the, the charity has really changed the conversation about it um, and now museums are re actively seeking you know I mean it's obvious of course you want to uh, interest children I mean, you want to interest children more than anyone in a way because yeah. uh, they're the future so uh, you know to have a sort of stiff place where you, you where you feel sort of restricted um, is you know it's not helpful to anyone and I, in fact weirdly my experience in museums I mean I remember the science museum was probably my favorite growing up because there were these interactive areas and I just absolutely you know just blew my mind those those um those, those places but as a result of what the charity has done I think everything has become interactive everything has become you know you're immersing yourself in the reality of it and you know it's good for kids and it's good for the adults and it just makes museums a more exciting and vibrant place to be so I think they do uh, great work and and just their, their their mere existence has an effect because every year you know museums 
you know, uh, essentially submit, you know, uh, their all the information about how they operate to to the board to try and win the sort of family friendly museum of the year award and they take it really seriously and so you know it's now become a really important part of their calendar um so yeah i you know i absolutely love that charity yeah and i you know i will push it as much <laughs> as i can and help as much as i um and they do these takeover days in november usually uh where essentially the kids take over the running of the museums and they're just such fun uh, <laughs> that's such a good yeah, idea big. though yeah yeah just from everything from the box office to the sort of curating and um you know putting on shows and yeah and that's a great fun. idea yeah wow you, you have to go i think oh, they yeah. probably had a bad year i don't think it happened last year but yeah Mm. be up and running again this year yeah hopefully so you mentioned your the science museum is one of your favorite museums uh do you have any other favorite museums i know you like to collect things yourself as well yeah i mean i do i do love the bna uh, i think they just like about six years ago they opened this the renaissance galleries um and i just think it's you know there's two very long large uh, rooms and just an incredible curation of objects and they really sort of get to the the mind the heart of the, the renaissance and what it was about and, you know how revolutionary it was how people's thinking about everything was changing and you know that i find it really exciting to get and they've just done it so beautifully um, um so yeah I, I i particularly love that i mean I, you know the british museum i always get a thrill when i go in there um there's the room on the right of the great court which is also such an incredible space um but uh with this called the enlightenment room and with all the cabinets and uh kind of globes and you know that i find that really inspiring um but yeah, I mean, I could, I don't, I mean, I go to museums all over the country and I just, I'm, uh, I'm down in Sussex uh, at the moment and there's the, uh, like there's the Weald and Downham Museum, which is, sort of, you know, it, it's like this, um, it's actually where they film the, that program, the, um, the repair shop, but the whole, it's all, the whole thing's perfectly sort of preserved kind of um, workshops and sort of um, these ancient buildings and these old barns and, you know, a lot of working machinery. And yeah, so that's, that's very exciting. Uh, I mean, there's, a, there's an exciting museum everywhere. It's a little treasure to be found. Yeah, there is, isn't it? You just need to look sometimes and just be like, oh, what is that? And go and have a look because you never know. Yeah. So finally, um, if you could travel in time, mm -hmm. what are your top three time periods to visit? OK, well, I would say um, I would say definitely probably the, like the 17th century. And I would I would divide my time between um, maybe London at the time, the sort of later part of the century, uh, the kind of the London of the Enlightenment, Newton, um, and uh, uh, obviously you've got Gal Galileo sort of preceded him in, in Europe. But, but the idea of this sudden kind of explosion in knowledge and this explosion in knowledge being shared out um, would be incredibly exciting to sort of be part of that and also to go to one of the new coffee shops and <laughs> exactly but at the same time in a similar period you know I would love to go to be in Versailles uh you know uh, around the time of Louis the 14th uh kind of again the late 17th yeah. century um just for the just sheer <laughs> over the top uh i mean it, it must have 
probably been sort of hellish and and you know so ruled by ceremony and what have you and and really probably quite boring in places but just the sort of it's just the happier uh, the there's a very peak of, of sort of indulgence and majesty and kinghood and mm. um i would love to just sneak a peek at that um the other period i mean i've i'd have to say ancient rome i mean i i you know uh, sort of around maybe the end of the first century um you know augustus just a little bit after um and uh just because of just i i don't think i necessarily want to be a roman i think unless you were kind of wealthy or rich or or established it was probably quite a hard life but i mean the sheer ambition of the place the, the just the that sort of shut part of it the um the the imagination that they had um uh, the order uh i mean it's just what they built is just incredible um i mean i think they would have you know they were hard people they they weren't necessarily the most in history they weren't necessarily the most artistic period um i mean architecture yeah incredible but uh you know even compared to the renaissance but uh it's just just the the ambition of 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 of, of that time and place um and then i think thirdly i would actually you know have to say the renaissance uh, italy sort of around the time i'm talking now you know florence rome mm. venice uh in the sort of late uh 15th early 16th century just when they everything you know and it, again it was an explosion you know books were being printed uh for the first time knowledge was being shared out um but just the way, you know, and suddenly there were these thoughts that maybe the earth isn't actually the center of the universe and, you know, our place in things. Um, and I think people, you know, move for the first time from just sort of concentrating on sort of gods and, and you know, really we're looking at people uh, and, and what we all were and what it meant to be human. And it was, must have just been extraordinary time um to, to to be alive just this inferno of ideas so yeah, yeah those would be my places absolutely well thank you and thank you so much for speaking with me today um so i hope people have been inspired to start reading a bit and to start exploring history and heritage maybe their local museums as well and i just have to say winchester heritage open days is an incredible opportunity to explore a heritage open days in general actually uh, and there are many events throughout the 2021 festival so do check out the website because uh, there's so much going on um so yeah thank you so much